It was after nightfall when, wet and tired, the travelers came at last to the brandy wine, and they found the way barred. At either end of the bridge there was a great spiked gate, and on the further side of the river they could see that some new houses had been built, two-storied, with narrow, straight-sided windows, bare and dimly lit, all very gloomy and unshire-like. They hammered on the outer gate and called, but there was at first no answer. And then, to their surprise, someone blew a horn, and the lights in the windows went out. A voice shouted in the dark. Who's that? Free off! You can't come in! Can't you read the notice? No admittance between sundown and sunrise? Of course we can't read the notice in the dark! Sam shouted back. And if hobbits of the Shire are to be kept out of the wet on a cold night like this, I'll tear down your notice when I find it! At that, a window slammed, and a crowd of hobbits with lanterns poured out of the house on the left. They opened the further gate, and some came over the bridge. When they saw the travellers, they seemed frightened. Come along, said Mary, recognising one of the hobbits. If you don't know me, Hob Hayward, you ought to. I'm Mary Brandybuck, and I should like to know what all this is about. And what a bucklander like you is doing here. You used to be on the Haygate. Bless me. It's Master Mary, to be sure, and all dressed up for fighting, said old Hob. Why, they said you were dead. Lost in the old forest, by all accounts. I'm pleased to see you alive after all. Then stop gaping at me through the bars and open the gate, said Mary. I'm sorry, Master Mary, but we have orders. Whose orders? The chief's up at Bag Inn. Chief, do you mean Mr. Lotho? Said Frodo. Well, I suppose so, Mr. Baggins, but we have to say just the chief nowadays. Do you indeed? Said Frodo. Well, I'm glad he has dropped the Baggins at any rate. But it is evidently high time that the family dealt with him and put him in his place. A hush fell on the hobbits beyond the gate. It won't do no good talking that way, no. said one. You get to hear of it. And if you make so much noise, you'll wake up the chief's big man. We shall wake him up in a way that will surprise him, said Mary. If you mean that your precious chief has been hiring ruffians out of the wild, then we've not come back too soon. He sprang from his pony and seeing the notice in the light of the lanterns, he tore it down and threw it over the gate. The hobbits backed away and made no move to open it. Come on, Pippin, said Mary. Two is enough. Mary and Pippin climbed the gate, and the hobbits fled. Another horn sounded. Out of the bigger house on the right, a large, heavy figure appeared against the light in the doorway. What's all this? He snarled as he came forward. Gate breaking. You clear out or I'll break your filthy little necks. Then he stopped, for he had caught the gleam of swords. (sighs) Bill Fernie, said Mary. If you don't open that gate in ten seconds, you'll regret it. I shall set steel to you if you don't obey. And when you've opened the gates, you will go through them. And never return. You're a ruffian and a highway robber. Bill Fernie flinched and shuffled to the gate and unlocked it. Give me the key, said Mary. But the ruffians flung it at his head and then darted out of the darkness. As he passed the ponies, one of them let fly with his heels and just caught him as he ran. He went off with a yelp into the night and was never heard of again. They were belt, said Sam, meaning the pony. Not much for your big man, said Mary. We'll see the chief later. In the meantime, we want a lodging for the night. And as you seem to have pulled down the bridge in and built this dismal place instead, you'll have to put us up. I'm sorry, Mr. Murray, said Hob. But but it isn't allowed. What isn't allowed? Um... Taking in folk off la- off hand like and eating extra food and all that, said Hob. What's the matter with this place? said Mary. Has it been a bad year or what? I thought it'd been a fine summer in harvest. Well, no, the, the year's been good enough, said Hob. We grows a lot of food, uh, but we don't rightly know what's become of it. It's all these gatherers and sharers, I reckon. <laughs> And going around counting and measuring and taking off to storage. They do more gathering than sharing and 
we never see most of the stuff again. Oh, oh come, said Pippin, yawning. This is all too tiresome for me tonight. We've got food in our bags. Just give us a room to lie down in. It'll be better than many places I've seen. The hobbits at the gate still seemed ill at ease. Evidently some rule or other was being broken, but there was no gainsaying four such masterful travellers, all armed, and two of them uncommonly large and strong-looking. Frodo ordered the gates to be locked again. There was some sense in any rate in keeping a guard, while Ruffins were still about. Then the four companions went into the hobbit guardhouse and made themselves as comfortable as they could. It was a bare and ugly place, with a mean little grate that would not allow a good fire. In the upper rooms were little rows of hard beds, and on every wall there was a notice and a list of rules. Pippin tore them down. There was no beer and very little food. But with what the travellers brought and shared out, they all made a fair meal, and Pippin broke rule four by putting most of the next day's allowance of wood on the fire. Well now, what about a smoke? Well, you tell us what has been happening in the Shire, he said. Uh, there is no pipe weed now, said Hob. At least only four of the chief's men. All the stocks seem to have gone. We do hear that the wagon loads of it uh, went away down in the old road out of the south farthing over Sarn Ford Way. Uh, that would be the end of last year after you left, but it had been going away quietly before that in a small way. That loath oak cried several of the others. You know talk of that sort isn't allowed. The chief will hear of it, and we'll all be in trouble. He wouldn't hear or not if some of you weren't snakes, rejoined Hob hotly. All right, all right, said Sam. That's quite enough. I don't want to hear no more. No welcome, no beer, no smoke, and a lot of rules and orc talk instead. I hope to have a rest, but I can see there's work and trouble ahead. Let's sleep and forget it till morning. The new chief evidently had means of getting news. It was a good forty miles from the bridge to Bag End, but someone made the journey in a hurry. So Frodo and his friends soon discovered. They had not made any definite plans, but had vaguely thought of going down to Crick Hollow together first, and resting there a bit. But now, seeing what things were like, they decided to go straight to Hobbiton. So the next day they set along the road and jogged along steadily. The wind had dropped, but the sky was grey. The land looked rather sad and forlorn, but it was, after all, the first of November and the fag end of autumn. Still, there seemed an unusual amount of burning going on, and smoke rose from many points round about. A great cloud of it was going up far away in the direction of the woody end. As evening fell, they were drawing near to Frogmorton, a village right on the road, about twenty-two miles from the bridge. There they meant to stay the night. The floating log at Frogmorton was a good inn, but as they came to the east end of the village, they met a barrier with a large board saying, No Road. And behind it stood a large band of sheriffs, with staves in their hands and feathers in their caps, looking both important and rather scared. What's all this? said Frodo, feeling inclined to laugh. This is what it is, Mr. Baggins, said the leader of the sheriffs, a two-feather hobbit. You're arrested for gatekeeping and tearing up of rules and assaulting gatekeepers and trespassing and sleeping in shire buildings without leave and bribing guards with food. And what else? said Frodo. That'll do to go on with, said the sheriff leader. I can add some more if you'd like it, said Sam. Calling your chief names, wishing to punch his pimply face, and thinking you sure look a lot of tom fools. There, there now, mister, that'll do. It's the chief's orders that you're to come along quiet. We're going to take you to Bywater and hand you over to the chief's men, and when he deals with your case, you can have your say. But if you don't want to stay in the lock holes away any longer than you need, I should cut the way short if I was you. To the discomfiture of the sheriffs, Frodo and his companions <laughs> all roared with laughter. <laughs> don't, don't be absurd, said Frodo. I'm going where I please, and in my own time. I happen to be going to Bag End on business, but if you insist on going too, well, that is your affair. 
Uh, very well, Mr. Baggins, said the leader, pushing the barrier aside. But don't forget, I've arrested you! I won't, said Frodo. Never. But I may forgive you. Now, I am not going any further today, so if you'll kindly escort me to the floating log, I'll be obliged. I can't do that, Mr. Baggins. The inn's closed. There's a sheriff house on the far end of the village. I'll take you there. All right, said Frodo. Go on and we'll follow. Sam had been looking at the sheriffs up and down and had spotted one that he knew. Hey, come here, Robin Smallborough, he called. I want a word with you. With a sheepish glance at his leader, who looked wrathful but did not dare to interfere, Sheriff Smallborough fell back and walked beside Sam, who got down off his pony. Look here, Cock Robin, said Sam. You're Hobbiton bred, and ought to have more sense coming away laying Mr. Frodo and all. And what's all this about the inn being closed? They're all closed, said Robin. The chief doesn't hold with beer. Leastways, that is how it started. But now I reckon it's his men that has it all. And he doesn't hold with folk moving about, so if they will or they must, then they has to go to the sheriff's house and explain their business. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, having anything to do with such nonsense, said Sam. You used to like the inside of an inn better than the outside yourself. You were always popping in, on duty or off. And so I would be still, Sam, if I could. But don't be hard on me. What can I do? You know how I went for a sheriff seven years ago before any of this began? Gave me a chance of walking around the country and seeing folk and hearing the news and knowing where the good beer was, but now it's different. But you can give it up. Stop sheriffing, if it has stopped being a respectable job, said Sam. We're, we're not allowed to, said Robin. If I hear not allowed much oftener, said Sam, I'm gonna get angry. Can't say as I'd be sorry to see it said Robin, lowering his voice. If we all got angry together. Something might be done. But it's these men, Sam. The chief's men. He sends them round everywhere. And if any of us small folks stand up for our rights, they drag them off to the lock holes. They took old Flower Dumpling, old Will Whitford, the mayor, first. And they've taken a lot more. Lately it's been getting worse. Often they beat them now. Then why do you do that work for them? Said Sam angrily. Who said you to frog Morton? No one did. We stay here in the big sheriff house. We're the first East Farthing troop now. There's hundreds of sheriffs, all told. And they want more, with all these new rules. Most of them are in it against their will, but not all. Even in the Shire there are some, like, minding other folks' business and talking big. And there's worse than that. There's a few as do spy work for the chief and his men. Ah, so that's how you've had news of us, isn't it? That's right. We aren't allowed to send by it now, but... They use the old quick post service and keep special numbers at different points. One came in from Whitfarrows last night with a secret message. And another took it from here. The message came back this afternoon saying you was to be arrested and taken to Bywater, not direct to the lock holes. The chief wants to see you at once, evidently. He won't be so eager when Mr. Frodo has finished with him, says Sam. The sheriff house at Frogmorton was as bad as the bridge house. It had only one story but it had the same narrow windows, and it was built of ugly pale bricks, badly laid. Inside it was damp and cheerless, and supper was served on a long bare table that had not been scrubbed for weeks. The food deserved no better setting. The travellers were glad to leave the place. It was about eighteen miles to Bywater, and they set off at ten o'clock in the morning. They would have started earlier, only the delay so plainly annoyed the sheriff leader. The west wind had shifted northward and it was turning colder. But the rain was gone. It was rather a comic cavalcade that left the village, though the few folk that came out to stare at the get-up of the travellers did not seem quite sure whether laughing was allowed. A dozen sheriffs had been told off as escort to the prisoners, but Mary made them march in front, while Frodo and his friends rode behind. Mary, Pippin, and Sam sat at their ease, laughing and talking and singing, while the sheriff stumped along, trying to look stern and important. Frodo, however, was silent and looked rather sad and thoughtful. The last person they passed was a sturdy old gaffer, clipping a hedge. 
Hello, hello. He jeered. Now who's arrested who? Two of the sheriffs immediately left the party and went towards him. Later, said Mary. Order your fellows back to their places at once if you don't want me to deal with them. The two hobbits had a sharp word from the leader, came back sulkily. Now get on, said Mary. And after that, the travelers saw to it that their ponies' pace was quick enough to push the sheriffs along as fast as they could go. The sun came out, and in spite of the chilly wind, they were soon puffing and sweating. At the three-farthing stone, they gave it up. They had done nearly 14 miles with only one rest at noon. It was now three o'clock. They were hungry and very food store, and they could not stand the pace. Well, come along in your own time, said Mary. We're going on. Goodbye, Cock Robin, said Sam. I'll wait for you outside the Green Dragon if you haven't forgotten where that is. Don't dwell on the way. You're breaking a rest, that's what you're doing, said the leader ruefully. And I can't be answerable. We shall break a good many things yet and not ask you to answer, said Pippin. Good luck to you. The travellers trotted on, and as the sun began to sink towards the white downs far away on the western horizon, they came to Bywater by its wide pool. And there they had their first really painful shock. This was Frodo and Sam's own country, and they found out now that they cared about it more than any other place in the world. Many of the houses that they had known were missing. Some seemed to have been burned down. The pleasant row of old hobbit holes in the bank on the north side of the pool were deserted. And their little gardens that used to run down bright into the water's edge were rank with weeds. Worse, there was a whole line of the ugly new houses all along poolside, where the Hobbiton Road ran close to the bank. An avenue of streets had stood there. They were all gone. And looking with dismay, up the road towards Bag End, they saw a tall chimney of brick in the distance. It was pouring out black smoke into the evening air. Sam was beside himself. I'm going right on, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I'm going to see what's up. I want to find my gaffer. We ought to find first what we're in for, Sam, said Mary. I guess that their chief will have a gang of ruffians handy. We had better find someone who will tell us how things are around here. But in the village of Bywater, all the houses and holes were shut, and no one greeted them. They wondered at this, but they soon discovered the reason of it. When they reached the Green Dragon, the last house on the Hobbiton side, now lifeless and with broken windows, they were disturbed to see half a dozen large, ill-favored men lounging against the inn wall. They were squint-eyed and sallow-faced. Like that friend of Bill Fernie's at Bree. Like many that I saw at Isengard, muttered Merry. The ruffians had clubs in their hands and horns by their belts, but they had no other weapons, as far as could be seen. As the travellers rode up, they left the wall and walked into the road, blocking the way. Where do you think you're going? said one, the largest and most evil-looking of the crew. There's no road for you any further. And where are those precious sheriffs? Coming along nicely, said Mary. A little foot sore, perhaps. We promised to wait for them here. Darn, what did I say? Said the ruffian to his mates. I told Sharky it was no good trusting those little fools. Some of our chaps ought to have been set. And what difference would that have made, pray? Said Mary. We're not used to footpads in this country. But we know how to deal with them. Footpads, eh? said the man. So that's your tone, is it? Change it or we'll change it for you. You little folk are getting too uppish. Don't you trust too much of the boss's kind heart. Sharky's come now. And he'll do what Sharky says. And what may that be? said Frodo quietly. This country wants waking up and setting to rights, said the ruffian. And Sharky's gonna do it and make it hard if you drive him to it. You'll need a bigger boss. And you'll get one before the year is out. If there is any more trouble. Then you'll learn a thing or two, you little rat folk. Indeed. I'm glad to hear of your plans, said Frodo. 
I'm on my way to call on Mr. Lotho, and he may be interested to hear of them too. The ruffian laughed. Lotho! He knows all right. Don't you worry. He'll do what Sharky says, because if a boss gives trouble, we can change him. See? And if little folks try to push him where they're not wanted, we can push them out of mischief, see? Yes, I see, said Frodo. For one thing, I see that you're behind the times and the news here. Much has happened since you left the South. Your day is over, and all other ruffians. The Dark Tower has fallen, and there is a king in Gondor. An Isengard has been destroyed, and your precious master is a beggar in the wilderness. I passed him on the road. The king's messengers will ride up from the Greenway now. Not bullies from Isengard. The man stared at him and smiled. Oh, a beggar in the wilderness, <laughs> he mocked. Oh, is he indeed? Oh, swagger it, swagger it, my little cockerel. But that won't stop us living in this fat little country where you have lazed long enough and... He snapped his fingers in Frodo's face. King's messengers, that but them. When I see one, I'll take notice, perhaps. This was too much for Pippin. His thoughts went back to the field of Cormalin, and here was a squint-eyed rascal calling the ring-bearer Little Cockerwhoop. He cast back his cloak, flashed out his sword, and the silver and sable of Gondor gleamed on him as he rode forward. I am a messenger of the king, he said. You are speaking to the king's friend, and one of the most renowned in all the lands of the west. You are a ruffian and a fool! Down on your knees in the road and ask pardon! Or I will set this troll's bane in you! The sword glinted in the westering sun. Merry and Sam drew their swords also and rode up to support Pippin. But Frodo did not move. The ruffians gave back. Scaring Breland peasants and bullying bewildered hobbits had been their work. Fearless hobbits with bright swords and grim faces were a great surprise. And there was a note in the voices of these newcomers that they had not heard before. It chilled them with fear. Go! said Merry. If you trouble this village again, you will regret it. The three hobbits came on, and then the ruffians turned and fled, running away up the hobbiton road. But they blew their horns as they ran. <sighs> well, we've come back none too soon, said Merry. Not a day too soon. Perhaps too late, at any rate to save Lotho, said Frodo. Miserable fool, but I'm sorry for him. Save Lotho? Whatever do you mean? Said Pippin. Destroy him, I should say. I don't think you're quite understanding things, Pippin, said Frodo. Lotho never meant things to come to this pass. He has been a wicked fool, but he's caught now. The ruffians are on top, gathering, robbing and bullying and, and running or ruining things as they like in his name. And not in his name, even for much longer. He's a prisoner in Bag End now, I expect. And very frightened. We ought to try and rescue him. Well, I am staggered, said Pippin. Of all the ends to our journey, that is the very last I should have thought of. To have to fight half-orcs and ruffians in the Shire itself. To rescue Lothal Pimple. Fight? said Frodo. Well, I suppose it may come to that. But remember... There is to be no slaying of hobbits, not even if they have gone over to the other side. Really gone over, I mean, not just obeying ruffians' orders because they are frightened. No hobbit has ever killed another on purpose in the Shire, and it is not to begin now. And nobody is to be killed at all if it can be helped. Keep your tempers and hold your hands to the last possible moment. But if there are many of these ruffians, said Mary, it will certainly mean fighting. He won't rescue Lothar or the Shire just by being shocked and sad, my dear Frodo. No, said Pippin. It won't be too easy scaring them a second time. They were taken by surprise. You heard that horn blowing? Evidently there are other ruffians near at hand. They'll be much bolder when there's more of them together. We ought to think of taking cover somewhere for the night. After all, we are only four, even if we are armed. I have an idea, said Sam. Let's go to old Tom Cotton's down south line. He always was a stout fellow, and he has a lot of lads that were all friends of mine. No, said Mary. It's no good getting undercover. That's just what people have been doing, and just what these ruffians like. They'll simply come down on us in force, corner us, 
and then drive us out, or burn us in. No, we have got to do something at once. Do what? said Pippin. Raise the Shire, said Mary. Now, wake all our people. They hate all this, you can see. All of them except perhaps one or two rascals and a few fools that want to be important, but not all understand what's really going on. But Shire folk have been so comfortable so long they don't know what to do. They just want to match them, and they'll all go up in fire. The chief's men must know that. They'll try to stamp on us and put us out quick. You've only got a very short time. Sam, you can make a dash for Cotton's farm if you like. He's the chief person around here in the sturdiest. Come on! I'm going to blow the horn of Rohan and give them all some music they have never heard before. They rode back to the middle of the village. There Sam turned aside and galloped off to the lane that led south to Cotton's. They had not gone far when he heard a sudden clear horn call go up ringing into the sky. Far over the hill and field it echoed, and so compelling was that call that Sam himself almost turned and dashed back. His pony reared and neighed. On, lad! On! He cried. We'll be going back soon! Then he heard Mary change the note, and up went the horn cry of Buckland, shaking the air. Awake! Awake! Fear! Fire! Bows! Awake! Fire! Bows! Awake! Behind him, Sam heard a hubbub of voices and a great din and slamming of doors. In front of him, light sprang out in the gloaming. Dogs barked. Feet came running. Before he got to the lane's end, there was Farmer Cotton with three of his lads, young Tom, Jolly, and Nick, hurrying towards him. They had axes in their hands and barred the way. No, it's none of them ruffians! Sam heard the farmer say, It's a hobbit by the size of it, but all dressed up prayer. Oi! He cried. Who are you and what's all this to do? It's Sam Gamgee! I've come back! Farmer Cotton came up close and stared at him in the twilight. Well! He exclaimed. The voice is right and your face is no worse than it was, Sam. But I should have passed you in the street in that gear. You've been in foreign parts, seemingly. I feared you were dead. <sighs> that I ain't, said Sam. Not Mr. Frodo. He's here and his friends. And that's the to-do. They're raising the Shire! We're gonna clear out these ruffians, and their chief too. We're starting now. Good, good, cried Farmer Cotton. So it's begun at last. I've been itching for some trouble all this year, but folks wouldn't help. And I've had the wife and Rosie to think of. These ruffians don't stick at nothing, but come on now, lads. My water is up. We must be in it. What about Mrs. Cotton and Rosie? Said Sam. It isn't safe yet for them to be left all alone. My nibs is with them. Yeah, but you can go and help him if you have a mind, said Farmer Cotton with a grin. Then he and his sons ran off towards the village. Sam hurried to the house. By the large round door at the top of the steps of the wide yard stood Mrs. Cotton and Rosie, and Nibs in front of them, grasping a hayfork. It's me! shouted Sam as he trotted up. Sam Gamgee! So don't try prodding me, Nibs! Anyway, I have a male shirt on me! He jumped down from his pony and went up the steps. They stared at him in silence. Good evening, Mrs. Cotton. He said. Hello, Rosie. Hello, Sam. Said Rosie. Where have you been? They said you were dead. But I've been expecting you since the spring. You haven't hurried, have you? <laughs> Perhaps not, said Sam abashed. But I'm hurrying now. We're setting about the ruffians. And I've got to get back to Mr. Frodo. But I thought I'd have a look and see how Mrs. Cotton was keeping. And you, Rosie. Oh, we've been keeping nicely, thank you, said Mrs. Cotton. Or should be, if it weren't for these thieving ruffians. Well, be off with you, said Rosie. If you've been looking after Mr. Frodo all this while, what do you want to leave him for as soon as things look dangerous? This was too much for Sam. It needed a week's answer. Or none. He turned away and mounted his pony. But as he started off, Rosie ran down the steps. I think you look fine, Sam, she said. Go on now, but take care of yourself and come straight back as soon as you've settled the ruffians. When Sam got back, he found the whole village roused. Already, apart from many younger lads, more than a hundred sturdy hobbits were assembled with axes and heavy hammers and long knives and a few hunting bows. More were still coming in from outlying farms. Some of the village folk had lit a large fire just to enliven things and also because it was one of the things forbidden by the chief. 
It burned bright as night came on. Others at Mary's orders were setting up barriers across the road at each end of the village. When the sheriffs came up to the lower one, they were dumbfounded, but as soon as they saw how things were, most of them took off their feathers and joined in the revolt. The others slunk away. Sam found Frodo and his friends by the fire talking to old Tom Cotton, while an admiring crowd of Bywater folk stood round and stared. Well, what's the next move? said Farmer Cotton. I can't say, said Frodo, until I know more. How many of these ruffians are there? It's hard to tell, said Cotton. They moves about and comes and goes. There's sometimes fifty of them in their sheds up in Hobbiton Way, but they go out from there roving round, thieving or gathering as they call them. Still, there's seldom less than a score around the boss, as they names him. He's at Bag End. Or was. But he don't go outside the grounds now. No one's seen him at all. In fact, for a week or two. But the men don't let no one go near. Hobbiton's not their only place, is it? No. More is the pity, said Cotton. There's a good few down south in Longbottom and by Sarn Ford, I hear, and some more lurking in the woody end. And they've sheds at Waymeet. And there's a lock holes, as they call them. The old storage tunnels at Mickle Delving that they've made into prisons for those that stand up to them. Still, I reckon there's not above three hundred of them in the Shire, all told. Maybe less. We can master them if we stick together. Have they got any weapons? said Mary. Whips, knives, and clubs. Enough for their dirty work. That's all they've showed so far, said Cotton. But I dare say they've got other gear if it comes to fighting. Some have bows, anyway. And they've shot one or two of our folk. There you are, Frodo, said Mary. I knew we should have to fight. Well, they started the killing. Not exactly, said Cotton. Leastways, not the shooting. Took started that. You see, your dad, Mr. Peregrine, he's never had no truck with his Lotho, nor from the beginning. Said that if anyone was going to play the chief at this time of day, it would be the right thing of the Shire and no upstart. And when Lotho sent his men, they got no chance out of him. Took's are lucky. They've got those deep holes in the green hills. The great spiels and all. And the ruffians can't come at them. And they won't let the ruffians come on their land. If they do, took hunt them. Took shot three for prowling and robbing. And after that, the ruffians turn nastier. And they keep a pretty close watch on Tukland. No one gets in or out of it now. Kid for the Tooks! cried Pippin. But someone is going to get in again now. I'm off to the Smails. Anyone coming with me to Tupper? Pippin rode off with half a dozen lads on ponies. See you soon! He cried. It's only 14 miles or so over the fields. I'll bring you back an army of Tooks in the morning! Mary blew a horn call after them as they rode off into the gathering night. The people cheered. All the same, said Frodo to all those who stood near. I wish for no killing, not even of the ruffians unless it must be done, to prevent them from hurting hobbits. All right, said Mary. But we shall be having a visit from the Hobbiton gang at any time now, I think. They won't come just to talk things over. We'll try to deal with them neatly, but we must be prepared for the worst. Now I've got a plan. Very good said Frodo. You make the arrangements. Just then, some hobbits who had been sent out towards Hobbiton came running in. They're coming! They said. A score or more, but two have gone off west across the country. To Waymead that will be, said Cotton, to fetch more of the gang. Well, it's fifteen miles each way. We didn't trouble about them just yet. Mary hurried off to give orders. As Farmer Cotton cleared the street, sending everyone indoors, except the older hobbits, who had weapons of some sort. They had not long to wait. Soon they could hear loud voices, and then the tramping of heavy feet. Presently a whole squad of the ruffians came down the road. They saw the barrier and laughed. They did not imagine that there was anything in this little land that would stand up to twenty of their kind together. The hobbits opened the barrier and stood aside. Thank you! Thank you! The men jeered. Now run home to bed before you wet. Then they marched along the streets shouting. Put those lights out. Get indoors and stay there. Or we'll take fifty of you into the lock holes for a year. Get in. The boss is losing his temper. No one paid any heed to their orders. But as the ruffians passed, they closed in quietly behind and followed them. When the men reached the fire, there was Farmer Cotton standing all alone, warming his hands.
And who are you and what do you think you're doing? Said the ruffian leader. Farmer Cotton looked at him slowly. I was just going to ask you that, he said. This isn't your country, and you're not wanted. Well, you're wanted anyhow, said the leader. We want you. Take him, lads. Lock holes for him, and give him something to keep him quiet. The men took one step forward and stopped short. There rose a roar of voices all around them, and suddenly they were aware that Farmer Cotton was not all alone. They were surrounded. In the dark on the edge of the firelight stood a ring of hobbits that had crept up out of the shadows. There was nearly two hundred of them, all holding some weapon. Mary stepped forward. We have met before, he said to the leader, and I warned you not to come back here. I warn you again. You are standing in the light and you are covered by archers. If you lay a finger on this farmer, or anyone else, you will be shot at once. Lay down any weapons that you have. The leader looked around. He was trapped, but he was not scared. Not now with a score of his fellows to back him. He knew too little of hobbits to understand his peril. Foolishly, he decided to fight. It would be easy to break out. Hurt them, lads! He cried. Let them have it! With a long knife in his left hand and the club on the other, he made a rush at the ring, trying to burst out back towards Hobbiton. He aimed a savage blow at Mary, who stood in his way. He fell dead with four arrows in him. That was enough for the others. They gave in. Their weapons were taken from them, and they were roped together, and marched off to an empty hut that they had built themselves. And there they tied hand and foot, and looked up under guard. The dead leader was dragged off and buried. <laughs> Seems almost too easy after all, don't it? Said Cotton. I said we could master them, but we needed a call. You came back in the nick o' time, Mr. Mary. There's more to be done still, said Mary. If you're right in your reckoning, we haven't dealt with a tithe of them yet. But it's dark now. I think the next stroke must wait till morning. Then we must call on the chief. Why not now? Said Sam. It's not much more than six o'clock, and I want to see my gaffer. Do you, do you know what's come of him, Mr. Cotton? He's not too well, and not too bad, sir, said the farmer. They dug up Bagshot Row, and that was a sad blow to him. He's in one of the new houses that the chief's men used to build, while they still did any work other than burning and thieving. Not above a mile from the end of Bywater. But he comes round to me when he gets a chance, and I see he's better fed than some of the poor bodies. All against the rules, of course. I'd have had him with me, but that wasn't allowed. Thank you indeed, Mr. Cotton, and I'll never forget it, said Sam. But I want to see him. That boss, and that sharky, as they spoke of, they might do a mischief up there before the morning. All right, Sam, said Cotton. Choose a lad or two and go and fetch him to my house. You'll not have need to go near the old Hobbiton village over water. My jolly here will show you. Sam went off. Mary arranged for lookouts round the village and guards at the barriers during the night. Then he and Frodo went off with Farmer Cotton. They sat with the family in the warm kitchen, and the Cottons asked a few polite questions about their travels, but hardly listened to the answers. They were far more concerned with events in the Shire. It all began with Pimple, as we call them, said Farmer Cotton. And it began as soon as you'd gone off, Mr. Frodo. He'd funny ideas, had Pimple. Seems he wanted to own everything himself, and then order other folk about. It soon came out that he already did own a sight more than was good for him. And he was always grabbing more. Well, though where he got the money was a, a mystery. Mills and malt houses and inns and farms and, and leaf plantations. He'd already bought Sandyman's mill before he came to Bag End, seemingly. Of course, he started with a lot of property in the South Farthing, which he had from his dad. And it seemed he's been selling a lot of that best leaf and sending it away quietly for a year or two. But at the end of last year, he began sending away loads of stuff. Not only leaf. Things began to get short, and winter was coming on too. Folk got angry, but he had his answer. A lot of men, ruffians mostly, came with great wagons. Some to carry off the goods south away, and others to stay. 
And before we knew where we were, we... They were planted here and there all over the Shire, and were felling trees, and digging and building themselves sheds and houses just as they liked. At first, goods and damages was paid for by Pimple, but soon they began lording it around and, and taking what they wanted. Then there was a bit of trouble, but not enough. Old Will, the mayor, set off for Bag End to protest, but he never got there. Ruffians laid hands on him and took him and locked him up in a hole in Mikkel Delving, and there he is now. And after that, it, it would be soon after New Year, there wasn't no more mayor. And Pimple called himself Chief Sheriff, or just Chief, and did as he liked. And if anyone got uppish, as they called it, they followed Will. So things went from bad to worse. There wasn't no smoke left, save for the men. And the chief didn't hold with beer, save for his men. And closed all the inns, and everything. And everything except rules got shorter and shorter. Unless one could hide a bit of one's own when the ruffians went around gathering stuff up for fair distribution. Which meant they got it and we didn't. Except for the lavings, which you could have at the sheriff houses if you, if you could stomach them. Oh, very bad. But since Sharky came, it's been plain ruination. Who is Sharky? said Mary. I heard of one of the ruffians speak of him. <laughs> the biggest ruffian of the lot, seemingly, answered Cotton. It was about last harvest end of September that we were first heard of him. We've never seen him, but he's up at Bag End and he's the real chief now, I guess. All the ruffians do what he says, and what he says is mostly hack, burn, and ruin. And now it's come to killing. There's no longer even any bad sense in it. They cut down trees and let them lie. And they burn houses and, and build no more. Take Sandyman's mill now. Pimple knocked it down almost as soon as he came to Bag End. Then he brought in a lot of dirty looking men to build a bigger one. And fill it full of wheels and outlandish contraptions. Only that fool Ted was pleased by that. And he works there cleaning wheels for the men, where his dad was the miller and his own master. Pimple's idea was to grind more and faster, or so he said. He's got other mills like it, but you've got to have grist before you can grind, and there was no more for the new mill to do than for the old. But since Sharky came, they don't grind no more corn at all. They're always a hammering and letting out a smoke and a stench, and there is no peace even at night in Hobbiton. And they pour out filth a purpose, and they've fouled all the lower water. And it's getting down into brandy wine. If they want to make the Shire into a desert, they're doing the right way about it. I don't believe that fool of a pimple's behind all this. It's Sharky, I say. That's right, put in young Tom. Why, they even took Pimple's old ma and Lobelia. And he was fond of her, if no one else was. Some of the Hobbit unfolk, they saw it. She comes down the lane with her old umbrella. Some of the ruffians were going up with the big cart. Where be you a-going, says she? To, to Bag End, says they. What for, says she? To put some sheds for Sharky, says they. Who said you could, said she? Sharky, says they. So get out of the old road, old haggling. I'll give you, Sharky, you dirty little thieving ruffian, says she, and puts up with her umbrella and goes for the leader, near twice her size. So they took her, dragged her off into the lock holes at her age, too. They've took others we miss more, but there's no denying she showed more spirit than most. Into the middle of this came Sam, bursting in with his gaffer. Old Gamgee did not look much older, but he was a little deafer. Good evening, Mr. Baggins, he said. Glad indeed I am to see you safe back. I've had a bone to peck with you, in a manner of speaking, if I may be so bold. You didn't never ought to have, have a sold bag end, as I've always said. That's what started out all the mischief. And while you've been traipsing in foreign parts, chasing black men up mountains from, from what my Sam says, to what for he don't make clear, they've been in dug up Bagshot Row and they've ruined my taters. I'm very sorry, Mr. Gamgee, said Frodo. But now I've come back. I'll do my best to make amends. Well, 
You can't say fairer than that, said the gaffer. Mr. Frodo Baggins is a real gentle hobbit, I have always have said. Whatever you may think of some others of the name, begging your pardon. And I hope my Sam's behaved himself and given satisfaction. Perfect satisfaction, Mr. Gamgee, said Frodo. Indeed, if you will believe it, he's now one of the most famous people in all the lands. And they're making songs about his deeds from here to the sea and beyond the great river. Sam blushed. But he looked gratefully at Frodo, for Rosie's eyes were shining, and she was smiling at him. It takes a lot of believing, said the gaffer, though I can see he's been mixing in strange company. What's come of his waistcoat? I don't hold with wear and ironmongery, whether it wears well or no. Farmer Cotton's household and all his guests were up early next morning. Nothing had been heard in the night, but more trouble would certainly come before the day was old. Seems as if none of the ruffians were left up at Bag End, said Cotton. But the gang from Waymeet will be along any time now. After breakfast, a messenger from the Tookland rode in. He was in high spirits. The Thane has raised all our country, he said. And the news has gone up far all ways. The ruffians that were watching our land have fled off south. Those escaped alive, the Thane has gone after them to hold off the big gang down that way. But he sent Mr. Peregrine back with all the other folk he can spare. The next news was less good. Mary, who had been out all night, came riding in about ten o'clock. There's a big band about four miles away, he said. They're coming along the road from Waymeet, but a good many stray ruffians have joined up with them. There must be close on a hundred of them. And they're fire-raising as they come. Curse them! Ah, uh, this lot won't stay to talk. They'll kill if they can, said Farmer Cotton. If Tukes don't come sooner, we'd best get behind cover and shoot without arguing. There's got to be some fighting before this is settled, Mr. Frodo. Before long, they marched in. A hundred strong, from Tuckborough and the Green Hills with Pippin at their head. Merry now had enough sturdy hobbitry to deal with the ruffians. Scouts reported that they were keeping close together. They knew that the countryside had risen against them, and plainly meant to deal with the rebellion ruthlessly, at its centre in Bywater. But however grim they might be, they seemed to have no leader among them who understood warfare. They came on without any precautions. Merry laid his plans quickly. The ruffians came trampling along the east road, and without halting turned up the Bywater road, which ran for some way sloping up between high banks with low hedges on top. Round a bed, about a furlong from the main road, they met a stout barrier of old farm carts upturned. That halted them. At the same moment, they became aware that the hedges on both sides, just above their heads, were all lined with hobbits. Behind them, other hobbits now pushed out some more wagons that had been hidden in a field, and so blocked the way back. A voice spoke to them from above. Well, you've walked into a trap! Your fellows from Hobbiton did the same, and one is dead and the rest are prisoners. Lay down your weapons! Then go back twenty paces and sit down! Any who try to break out will be shot. But the ruffians could not now be cowed so easily. A few of them obeyed, but were immediately set on by their fellows. A score or more broke back and charged the wagons. Six were shot, but the remainder burst out, killing two hobbits, and then scattering across country in the direction of Woody End. Two more fell as they ran. Merry blew a loud horn call, and there were answering calls from the distance. They won't get far, said Pippin. All that country is alive with our hunters now. Behind the trapped men in the lane, still about four score tried to climb the barrier in the banks, and the hobbits were obliged to shoot many of them, or hew them with axes. But many of the strongest and most desperate got out on the west side and attacked their enemies fiercely, being now more bent on killing than escaping. Several hobbits fell and the rest were wavering when Merry and Pippin, who were on the east side, came across and charged the ruffians. Merry himself slew the leader, a great squint-eyed brute, like a huge orc. Then he drew his forces off, encircling the last remnant of the men in a wide ring of archers. At last, all was over. Nearly 70 of the ruffians lay dead on the field, and a dozen were prisoners. 19 hobbits were killed, and some 30 were wounded. The dead ruffians were laden on wagons and hauled off to an old sand pit nearby, and they are buried in the battle pit, as it was afterwards called. The fallen hobbits were laid together in a grave on the hillside, where later a great stone was set up with a garden about it. So ended the Battle of Bywater, 1419.
the last battle fought in the Shire, and the only battle since the Greenfields, 1147, are way up in the North Farthing. In consequence, though it happily cost very few lives, it has a chapter to itself in the Red Book, and the names of all those who took part were made into a roll, and learned by heart by Shire historians. The very considerable rise in the fame and fortune of the Cottons dates from this time, but at the top of the roll in all accounts stand the names of Captains Maria Dock and Peregrine. Frodo had been in the battle, but he had not drawn a sword, and his chief part has been to prevent the hobbits in their wrath at their losses from slaying those of their enemies who threw down their weapons. When the fighting was over and the later labours were ordered, Merry, Pippin and Sam joined him, and they rode back with the cottons. They ate a late midday meal, and then Frodo said with a sigh, Well, I suppose it is time now that we dealt with the chief. Yes, indeed. The sooner the better, said Merry. And don't be too gentle. He's responsible for bringing in these ruffians, and for all the evil that they have done. Farmer Cotton collected an escort of some two dozen sturdy hobbits. For it's only a guess that there is no ruffians left at Pack End, he said. We don't know. Then they set out on foot. Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin led the way. It was one of the saddest hours in their lives. The great chimney rose up before them, and as they drew near, the old village across the water, through rows of new mean houses along each side of the road, they saw the new mill in all its frowning and dirty ugliness. A great brick building, straddling the stream, which it fouled with the steaming and stinking overflow. All along the Bywater Road, every tree had been felled. As they crossed the bridge and looked up the hill, they gasped. Even Sam's vision in the mirror had not prepared him for what he saw. The old grange on the west side had been knocked down, and its place taken by rows of tarred sheds. And the chestnuts were gone. The banks and hedgerows were broken. Great wagons were standing in disorder, in a field beaten bare of grass. Bagshot Row was yawning sand and gravel quarry. Bag end up beyond could not be seen for a clutter of large huts. They've cut it down! cried Sam. They've cut down the party tree! He pointed to where the tree had stood under which Bilbo had made his farewell speech. It was lying lopped and dead in the field. As if this was the last straw, Sam burst into tears. <laughs> a laugh put an end to them. There was a surly hobbit lounging over the low wall of the wheel yard. He was grimy face and black-handed. Don't they like it, Sam? He sneered. But you always was soft. I thought you'd gone off in one of them ships you used to prattle about. Sailing, sailing. What do you want to come back for? We've work to do in the Shire now. So I see, said Sam. No time for washing, but time for wall propping. But see here, Master Sandyman. I've got a score to pay in this village, and don't you make it any longer with your jeering, or you'll foot a bill too big in your purse. Ted Sandyman spat over the wall. Dan, he said. You can't touch me. I'm a friend of the bosses. But he'll touch you, all right, if I have any more of your mouth. Don't waste any more words on the fool, Sam, said Frodo. I hope there are not many more hobbits that have become like this. It would be a worse trouble than all the damage the men have done. You are dirty and insolent, Sandyman, said Merry, and also very much out of your reckoning. we are just gone up the hill to remove your precious boss. We have dealt with his men. Ted gaped. For at that moment, he first caught sight of the escort, that at a sign from Mary now marched over the bridge. Dashing back into the mill, he ran out with a horn and blew it loudly. Ha <laughs> ha! Save your breath! Laughed Mary. I've a better. Then lifting up his silver horn, he winded it, and his clear call rang over the hill, and out of the holes and sheds and shabby houses of Hobbiton, the hobbits answered. 
band came pouring out, and with cheers and loud cries, they followed the company up the road to Bag End. At the top of the lane, the party halted, and Frodo and his friends went on, and they came at last to the one's beloved place. The garden was full of huts and sheds, some so near the old westward windows that they cut off all their light. There were piles of refuse everywhere. The door was scarred, the bell chain was dangling loose, and the bell would not ring. Knocking brought no answer. At length, they pushed and the door yielded. They went in. The place stank, but was full of filth and disorder. It did not appear to have been used for some time. Where is that miserable Lotho hiding? said Mary. They had searched every room and found no living thing save rats and mice. Shall we turn on the others to search the sheds? <sighs> this is worse than Mordor, said Sam. Much worse in a way. It comes home to you, as they say. Because it is home. And you remember it before it was all ruined. Yes, this is Mordor, said Frodo. Just one of its works. Saruman was doing its work all the time, even when we thought he was working for himself. And the same with those that Saruman tricked, like Lotho. Mary looked round in dismay and disgust. Let's get out! He said, if I'd known all the mischief that he had caused, I should have stuffed my pouch down Saruman's throat. No doubt. No doubt. But you did not. And so, I am able to welcome you home. There, standing at the door, was Saruman himself, looking well fed and well pleased. His eyes gleamed with malice and amusement. A sudden light broke on Frodo. Sharky! He cried. Saruman laughed. <laughs> Sir, you have heard the name, have you? All my people used to call me that in Isengard, I believe. A sign of affection, possibly. But evidently, you did not expect to see me here. I did not, said Frodo. But I might have guessed. A little mischief in a mean way. Gandalf warned me that you were still capable of it. Quite capable, said Saruman. And more than a little. You made me laugh, you hobbit lordlings. Riding along with all those great people. So secure and so pleased with your little selves. You thought you had done very well out of it, and could now just amble back and have a nice quiet time in the country. Saruman's home could be all wrecked, and he could be turned out, but no one could touch yours. Oh no! Gandalf would look after your affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Not he. When his tools have done their task, he drops them. But you must go dangling after him, dawdling and talking, and riding round twice as far as you need it. Well, thought I, if they are such fools, I will get ahead of them and teach them a lesson. One ill turn deserves another. It would have been a sharper lesson if only you had given me a little more time and a little more men. Still, I have already done much that you will find it hard to mend or undo in your lives. And it will be pleasant to think of that and set it against my injuries. Well... If that is what you find pleasure in, said Frodo, I pity you. It will be a pleasure of memory only, I fear. 
Go at once and never return. The hobbits of the village had seen Saruman come out of one of the huts, and at once they came crowding up to the door of Bag End. When they heard Frodo's command, they murmured angrily. Don't let him go! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! He's a man and a murderer! Saruman looked round at their hostile faces and smiled. Kill him! Kill him! He mocked. Kill him! If you think there are enough of you, my brave hobbits! He drew himself up and stared at them darkly with his black eyes. But do not think that when I lost all my goods, I lost all my power. Whoever strikes me shall be accursed. And if my blood stains the Shire, it shall wither and never again be healed. The hobbits recorded. But Frodo said, Do not believe him. He has lost all his power, save his voice that can still daunt you and deceive you, if you let it. But I will not have him slain. It is useless to meet revenge with revenge. It will heal nothing. Go, Saruman, by the speediest way. Worm! Saruman called, and out of a nearby hut came Wormtongue, crawling almost like a dog. To the road again, Worm! said Saruman. These fine fellows and lordlings are turning us adrift again. Come along! Saruman turned to go, and Wormtung shuffled after him. But even as Saruman passed close to Frodo, a knife flashed in his hand, and he stabbed swiftly. The blade turned on the hidden mail cloak and snapped. A dozen hobbits, led by Sam, leapt forward with a cry and flung the villain to the ground. Sam drew his sword. No, Sam! said Frodo. Do not kill him even now! For he has not hurt me. And in any case, I do not wish him to be slain in this evil mood. He was great once, of a noble kind that we should not dare to raise our hands against. He has fallen, and his cure is beyond us. But I would still spare him, in the hope that he may find it. Saruman rose to his feet and stared at Frodo. There was a strange look in his eyes of mingled wonder and respect and hatred. You have grown, halfling, he said. Yes, you have grown very much. You are wise and cruel. You have robbed my revenge of sweetness, and now I must go hence in bitterness. In debt of your mercy, I hate it! And you! Well, I go, and I will trouble you no more. But do not expect me to wish you health and long life. You will have neither. But that is not my doing. I merely foretell. He walked away, and the hobbits made a lane for him to pass. But their knuckles whitened as they gripped on their weapons. Wormtongue hesitated, and then followed his master. Wormtongue, called Frodo. You need not follow him. I know of no evil you have done to me. You can have a rest and food here for a while and until you are stronger. and can go your own ways. Wormtongue halted and looked back at him, half prepared to stay. Saruman turned. No evil? Oh no. Even when he sneaks out at night, it is not only to look at the stars. But did I hear someone ask where poor Lotho is hiding? You know, don't you, Worm? Will you tell them? Wormtongue cowered down and whimpered. <laughs> no. Then I will, said Saruman. Worm killed your chief. Poor little fellow. Your nice little boss. Didn't you, Worm? Stabbed him in his sleep, I believe. Buried him, I hope, though Worm has been very hungry lately. <laughs> no, Worm is not really nice. You had better leave him to me. A look of wild hatred came into Wormtongue's red eyes. You told me to! You made me do it! Saruman laughed. 
You do. You do what Sharky says. Always. Don't you, Worm? Well, now he says, follow. He kicked Worm Tongue in the face as he groveled and turned and made off. But at that, something snapped. Suddenly, Worm Tongue rose up, drawing a hidden knife. And then with a snarl like a dog, he sprang on Saruman's back, jerked his head back, cut his throat, and with a yell, ran off down the lane. Before Frodo could recover or speak a word, three hobbit bows twanged and Worm Tongue fell dead. To the dismay of those that stood by about the body of Saruman, a grey mist gathered, and rising slowly to a great height, like a smoke from a fire, as a pale shrouded figure it loomed over the hill. For a moment it wavered, looking to the west, but out of the west came a cold wind bent away, and with a sigh dissolved into nothing. Frodo looked down at the body with pity and horror, for as he looked it seemed that long years of death were suddenly revealed in it, and it shrank, and the shriveled face became rags of skin upon a hideous skull. Lifting up the skirt of the dirty cloak that sprawled beside it, he covered it over and turned away. And that's the end of that, said Sam. A nasty end, and I wish I needn't have to see it. But it's a good riddance, and the very last end of the war, I hope, said Mary. I hope so, said Frodo and sighed. The very last stroke. But to think that it should fall here, at the very door of Bag End, among all my hopes and fears, at least, I never expected that. I shan't call it the end till we've cleared up the mess, said Sam gloomily. And that will take a lot of time and work. <laughs> <laughs>